Welcome back to part two of Interview with a Vampire. Briefly summarizing this Interview with a Vampire series is one where I go over each individual part of Interview with a Vampire. We talk about the entire plot and a couple thematic nuances that I noticed while reading, supported by a few quotes here and there. So if you haven't seen part one, I highly recommend it because it's going to summarize the first fourth of this book for you, as well as give you an idea of the kind of themes and things that we're looking for as we move forward in the series. We left them aboard a ship about to sail away to Eastern Europe to try and discover more about the origins of the vampire and what it means to be a vampire. Part two. So as Claudia and Louis begin their journey to explore for more vampires, Louis remains tense and concerned about Lestat. He doesn't believe for an instant they successfully killed him in the fire. Claudia seems in very high spirit. She's observing passengers, befriending them to get little trinkets, and picking individuals out that she'll be eating later. Happily for these passengers, the ocean liner seems completely devoid of rats. Sadly for these passengers, it seems like there's some kind of strange illness on board. Louis, you uses this illness to avoid other passengers claiming he doesn't want to get sick. Lewis is concerned that Lestat surviving Claudia's first attempt at murdering him indicates that there's true immortality on the horizon. They will all remain conscious regardless of what state their body is in. But Claudia is a lot more practical. She supposes they dumped Lestat in that murky swamp water. He was able to avoid the sun that way. He rose again, fed off a couple of swamp animals, hitchhiked it back back to the local graveyard, hid in a coffin for the night, fed off some humans, turned the musician, and then came after them that night in their townhouse. Lewis is completely dumbfounded that Claudia has been thinking about this that much and that someone could survive the state they saw Lestat in. And Claudia kind of shrugs at him and just is like, well, I could have done it. And there's a heavy implication there that Lewis could not. He lacks that core will to survive that both Lestat and Claudia share in common. Lewis is still worried that absolutely nothing will destroy their consciousness, and he fears the idea of being alive and sentient while he is ashes. He sort of thinks he's being silly and fanciful, and that if they burn the body, there's nothing to rise, and that would be a true death for vampires. Is Lewis depressed? And that's why he can't have them living in the same state that Lestat was? Was Lewis privileged by the ease of his human life in a way that both Lestat and Claudia had to struggle, and that's why their will to live seems so much stronger and more intense than Lewis's? Is Lewis perhaps touching on a core truth about the unconscious, possibly unwilling? drive to continue surviving as a vampire. Could it be true possibly that a vampire or human's consciousness continues as long as their molecules exist somewhere in the ether? So Lewis was originally quite excited for this Eastern European journey. He's very hungry for more philosophy, literature, further study. But now that he's undertaking the journey, he's sort of too busy mourning the fact that he's not human going over the sea. He's obsessed with getting that bright, blue ocean color you see in daylight. One night he even takes a lantern and brings it right down towards the sea to see if he can get even a hint of that reflective quality. Some kind of pale imitation of life or what he imagines this would have been like if he was alive. And of course this lantern does not illuminate the water as the sun does. Instead of getting that beautiful blue color he gets this dark fathomless black and the light of the lantern comes back up at him like an eye staring into it. No matter where Lewis goes or what dreams he fulfills, he's never going to be happy. Lewis, your quest is for darkness only. This sea is not your sea. The myths of me are not your myths. Men's treasures are not yours. But oh, how the quest for the old world vampires filled me with bitterness in those moments. For what secret, what truths had those monstrous creatures of the night to give us? This is grief 
for the loss of his human nature increases every single day. He mourns all the little things he could have done as a man and will never be able to do again now that he's a monster. He retells the story of his sister, now elderly, going to visit his grave. Louis wanted to go to her, to comfort her, to tell her he is alive and well and that she need not feel sorry for him. But Lewis refrains because he knows his sister seeing him youthful as he is now will drive her mad. He's traveling, looking for a way, hopefully, to end his own existence, even though he knows he'd never have the courage to use it. So here we are dropping anchor in Varna within Eastern Europe, partially because of Dracula myths and all these older, more authentic myths. This is why Claudia picked this spot. Lewis describes this old world as dark and beautiful and lonely. He says he and Claudia were in more danger here than they were in New Orleans because they have small villages they're going through where deaths are heavily examined and because these people are more familiar with vampire mythos so they're significantly more suspicious of certain kinds of human demise. Finally, one evening, Louis and Claudia find themselves in a village that seems to have been completely shut up. And when they get to the inn, they find the doors surrounded by both crucifixes and garlic, which are common superstitions to deter vampire entry. This gets Claudia really excited and starts to get Lewis a little bit intrigued because he feels like something more must be going on in this town. The innkeeper does let them in, but she is very suspicious of them. She probably only allowed them entry because she sees Claudia and believes that she's an innocent child that needs protection. When the two of them get in, they meet Morgan, who is an Englishman in mourning. All of them go to another room where his dead wife is laid out for viewing, and Morgan goes over exactly why they need to leave this cursed land right away and what happened to his wife. He explains that he was an artist. He and his wife were honeymooning here in Eastern Europe because as an artist, he thought the landscapes here would be incredibly moving. They came out this way to this desolate town because there's a monastery ruins that are pretty well preserved, just a little bit over the rise. And he wanted to paint those ruins and get a good feel for them as he thought they'd be a beautiful subject matter. They never made it to those ruins though because when they got to this town, there was some kind of procession going on. And both Morgan and his wife were really curious about about it. They thought it was like a festival or celebration of sorts and they wanted to witness and partake it some of the quaint local culture they've been enjoying. The carriage they had rented refused to go into the town but let them off and the two of them walked into the village. When they got there they saw this procession wasn't really like a festival or a celebration. The whole village had gathered to go into the cemetery and at the cemetery they have this white horse that they release with a swift to the rear. Horse runs around the graveyard and stops at this very specific grave. The whole village digs up the grave of this woman who's been dead for about six months and when they open the coffin box it reveals a perfectly pristine body with no smell of rot or decay and no indication of death at all. It almost looks like she's been buried alive. And so far Morgan's been a little bit scared. He's held his wife on the outskirts so she can't see exactly what's going on. He's also a little mystified right now but things start to turn violent at this point where the villagers stake this corpse through the heart and lop off its head and then they gather her body to burn it to ashes and Morgan is terrified by this tradition he can see the mother of his daughter is weeping and being held back he has no idea why they're desecrating the corpse this way the whole thing has really scared him and he wants to leave now but no matter how much money he offers any of these people none of them are willing to take him out of town and he and his wife Elizabeth have no choice but to stay overnight at the inn and this is where his wife hears a little bit about the rumors of vampires and their myths and stuff and she's kind of like tittering and excited about it. So the two of them retire for the night in the inn. Everyone locks the doors up tight. There's all the garlic and crucifixes everywhere. Things should be okay. How did it happen to her? I asked him. I don't know, he gasps, shaking his head the flask pressed to his forehead as if it were something cool, refreshing, when it was not. It came into the inn? They say she went out to it, he confessed, the tears coursing down his cheeks. Then it was morning, and they were all shouting, and she was gone. Interview with a Vampire, page 178 and 179. 
So after explaining the death of his wife, Morgan kind of passes out and the innkeeper comes in and tells Lewis to leave. It's very clear the villagers are nervous about Elizabeth's body being intact and they plan to stake it and burn it in a similar fashion they did the other lady. And it's equally clear that Morgan does not want this. And Lewis here becomes oddly defensive of Morgan in his like passed out drunken state and tries to protect Elizabeth and insists that there's no reason to burn her body. Meanwhile, Claudia is pretending to sleep in his arms and sort of whispering to let the village people do whatever. It doesn't even really impact them. Like, why is he endangering them? But if anything, it seems like Claudia telling Lewis to quit it just makes him more desperate to protect Morgan. And this is another great pausing point for us because Lewis claims that his immediate kinship and connection to Morgan comes from the fact that when Morgan asked for his name, he actually gave his real name for the first time in forever, which meant to Lewis that he was known by Morgan and that gave them an immediate personal connection and brought out Lewis's like protective and more human side and his desire to be sort of like a caretaker to Morgan. As he advocates for the dignity of this stranger's dead wife, he actually puts himself and Claudia in danger to do so, elevating Morgan and this dead woman above himself and the daughter that he claims to love and would do anything for. And meanwhile, he doesn't seem to care at all that these villagers have been beset on and attacked by vampires. He's not doing anything to try and protect and help them. He doesn't even feel any kind of plight for the fact that they've been struggling for weeks or possibly months with this fear and this thing preying on them. But this activity is actually very exciting for Lewis and Claudia. They now know they're no longer alone and they might be about to solve the mystery of the vampire. So Lewis sort of leaves the inn, gets directions to the monastery, and the two of them just storm off to meet this vampire. Claudia herself is nothing but eagerness incarnate and Lewis is very fearful and hesitant, although he doesn't do a very good job describing why. It's just kind of like this amorphous terror. And for the first time, the two of them meet a vampire just cresting the slope with another unconscious human victim on their shoulder. I held fast to Claudia, ready in an instant to shove her behind me, to step forward and meet him. But then I saw with astonishment that his eyes did not see me as I saw him. Page 187 interview with a vampire. This is a not-so-friendly meeting of a new and strange vampire. The first thing it does is try to attack and kill Lewis. And as this attack's happening, Lewis realizes that the coat is torn and rotting, that there's nothing behind the eyes. This thing really seems more like a shambling zombie or a mindless creature than it does a vampire, as both he and Claudia are. And for a minute, things are really quite worrisome for Lewis, and then Claudia comes in like a badass and starts pelting this thing with stomps. Once it's distracted, Lewis gets his hand on this thing's hair and just bashes its face into the floor until it finally stops. And then while Lewis is catching his breath and taking stock of things, Claudia jumps on top of this vampire and takes pieces of its skull and starts scattering it around so it won't be able to rise again. We had met the European vampire, the creature of the old world. He was dead. Interview with a Vampire, page 188. So in a surprise twist, that human victim the vampire was carrying is Morgan. And he recognizes Lewis and calls out to him. And this just tortures Lewis's poor heart and he flees the scene. Claudia tries to call to him, tries to show him reason. In the end, she drinks from Morgan and then chases after Lewis, trying to get him to come back and feed since he hasn't for the night yet. And dawn is happening quickly. But Lewis ignores Claudia, drives her back to the carriage, shoves her up there, and starts running those horses as fast fast as he can. Gets to the inn, he sort of storms on in there with the crucifix the lady gave him and says that he had killed the vampire, gets them to bring the stuff up to his room, and gets them a safe place to stay for the evening. Once in the room, Claudia offers him her wrist and tries to get him to feed from her because he's going to starve otherwise for the night. And Lewis kind of like shrugs her off and is like, I'm gonna do the same thing I've done for a while now. And he just like shoves his hand into a wall and grabs out a rack. It's unclear if this is Lewis's imagination, but he has like these series of visions that include Claudia as an adult, sort of like embracing him, and the two of them safely retire for the evening. 
And while this is not the first time that Lewis has been highly imaginative in the book or been prone to some kind of extreme flight of fancy, it does seem like Lewis is less able to discern reality and his hallucinations. They're getting more intense and more prevalent. Now Lewis and Claudia continue their journeys in Eastern Europe as vampire hunters. They're welcomed in their towns, they meet many more Eastern vampires, and all of them are similar to this first meeting. Sometimes they kill them like they did him and sometimes they just watch them from afar. The closest they ever get to meeting a freshly raised vampire is a woman who had just been a few months dead, and Lois describes their meeting this way. In one hamlet, it was a woman, only dead for perhaps a few months. The villagers had glimpsed her and knew her by name. It was she who gave us the only hope we were to experience after the monster in Transylvania. And that hope came to nothing. She fled from us through the forest and we ran after her, reaching out to her long black hair. Her white burial gown was soaked with dried blood, her fingers caked with dirt of the grave, and her eyes, they were mindless, empty, two pools that reflected the moon. No secrets, no truths, only despair. Interview with a Vampire, page 193. How did these others exist, and why are they so different than them? Lewis is less concerned about the how, and more concerned about why are they so different than he and Claudia. And he sort of begins to worry that he and Claudia killed the only other sentient vampire in existence, possibly that Lestat knew some kind of secret mojo that made him and Claudia different than these other Eastern European vampires. And Lewis uses this discovery about these vampires as another way for him to fall into a funk about Lestat's death. He's really in his head about Lestat. He even feels like Lestat has just left rooms or like he can barely make out Lestat's laughter. The good times between he, Lestat, and Claudia sort of run in a loop and he's basically being haunted by his creator. Meanwhile, Claudia is busy trying to figure out why these vampires are so different. She supposes that if Lewis and Lestat had turned her and then instead of letting her wake up and exist as she was allowed, they put her in a box and buried her underground. By the time she broke out to the surface, the starvation and the isolation, the strain would have snapped her mind and she might be a mindless eating thing the same way these creatures are. An experience like that would break anyone's mind. And this sort of gets Claudia fixated again on the idea of turning and what it takes to turn another creature. She again wonders why Lewis can't make a vampire as Lestat. Horrified as Lewis, he never wants to do that or even try. And she sort of taunts him a little bit with this information. She wonders exactly how much blood it would take to resurrect someone. She speculates idly that perhaps Lewis has accidentally turned vampires before. Maybe he even left some monsters similar to those they're seeing now. Could he have left a drop of his blood on a victim or two before? Would that have been enough? And Lewis himself was a bunch of conflicted emotions over this. He realizes part of the reason he's so upset by Claudia bringing up the idea he might be capable of turning someone is that it's something he sort of subconsciously considered with Babette all those years ago. But as lonely as he was, as much as he had admired and loved her. He could never turn her. And this can help us draw some conclusions about how Louis, Lestat, and Claudia all view vampiric existence. Lestat sees vampirism as a gift. Claudia seems to see it as a mystery. And Louis sees it as a curse. And this is kind of interesting for us to ponder or talk about further because all three of these vampires live in extreme loneliness and isolation. And all of them see creating more vampires as a solution to this loneliness. Family Ghosts I tell you that as much as I hated Lestat, she stopped. Yes, I whispered. Yes. As much as I hated him, with him we were complete. Interview with a Vampire, page 196.
since they've been traveling abroad, there's been a lot of strain in their relationship, possibly since Claudia actually went through with killing Lestat and Louis turned away from her for the first time. Louis is sitting in his resentment, maintaining silence, sort of trying to pretend nothing is wrong. And Claudia has kept trying to find a way forward. She knows there's something that's not right and isn't quite sure how to piece it back together. But Louis isn't ready to face his feelings. Possibly he'll never be ready. But his inability to face how he feels about Claudia in the wake of her attack on Lestat is perhaps similar to how Claudia doesn't face how she might feel about Louis participating in her murder and turning. The two no longer confide or trust one another as they used to. And their different approaches when it comes to mending this rift is actually driving them further apart instead of helping them come together and find common ground. Neither can be what the other needs right now, and we're really in the beginning of seeing their relationships decline. And Claudia sort of announces they found everything there is to see here in Eastern Europe, and they're going to skip their plan tour and go right to Paris. I tell you, I begin to understand that we have done it all wrong from the start. We need our language, our people. I want to go directly to Paris. Page 198, interview with a vampire. And with that, Claudia and Louis are on their way out of Paris, and we're here at the end of part two. I have a few closing meta thoughts for you to consider on your way out to get you prepped for where we're going in part three. First of all, what do you think is behind Claudia's decision to go directly to Paris? Does she just believe the two need to change? Does she believe the plans she had set are not working? Is she trying to please Louis, who longs to go to Paris and would have wanted to go there from the first? Does she just believe that they've seen all there is to see from the Eastern European band? vampires. And also I want to take a moment and pause with some potential racial bias here in the text. Lewis seems to connect more easily with humans that he sees are like him, specifically white, well-off, and preferably male, or having a male-coded thinking process. The travels of Lewis and Claudia to Eastern Europe reference Bram Stoker's Dracula, and the original novel explores cultural differences between Englishmen and Eastern Europeans as well as possible cultural and racial tensions, and I feel like Interview with a Vampire is trying to echo some of those in its own way here. Specifically, it's exploring the idea of what it means to be separate or other, both like a vampire human or different human cultures, how that would translate over over from human life to a vampiric life, something being different makes it an other and makes you fear it or be suspicious of it or have less empathy for it. And I think both of these stories do a good job highlighting how tribalism within humans create this fear of the other and sometimes set humanity against itself when really they should be rallying together and all the other things they have that's so much more in common to fight whatever the vampire or the supernatural threat is within the story. Here with Lewis, he identifies with Morgan, who's the Englishman. He doesn't seem to identify with the innkeeper or a single other Eastern European person he meets. Claudia is the one who says that they need our language and our people, but Lewis has been longing for this cultural home and holding Paris up as like this glowing beacon or symbol since the very beginning. So that leaves us asking, is some of this racially motivated? Is there unconscious bias at play in Lewis's mindset? Is this more of a looking for your roots kind of thing or finding your heritage kind of thing? What exactly do you think about these pros, what they're trying to get across, what might have been intentional or unintentional? unintentional. Tell me about it in those comments down below. And how do you think any of this might call back when we watch Interview with a Vampire Season 1 and we get to see some more diverse casting going on? I want to thank you guys for coming with me on this ride in Part 2. It's a little bit shorter than Part 1, but strap in because Part 3 is going to be long and intense and go on forever if my notes are anything to go by. I hope to see you return in Part 3. And as always, keep reading. Bye.